Thank you all for coming to a, another monthly Greater Toronto Area Linux Users Group. Um, I'm going to keep it short and sweet. We have one of the directors from the Maker Festival, one of the biggest gatherings in Toronto for makers and creatives and the people that sell to them. Um, and so without further ado, I give it over to Eric Boyd. Explain it. That's good. <laughs> so I actually have a few background slides in here already. Um, the there is a thing called Maker Fair that started in the Bay Area in 2006. That was a gathering of makers, essentially people who you know spend their spare time at home or in the garages or at makerspaces or whatever, making fun things with their hands or with technology. And the the real roots of Maker Fair are in like electronics and 3D printing, but um, just like Maker Festival, it too has expanded to cover almost anything that you can do with your hands, including things like quilting or sitting, uh, sewing or origami or <clears throat> all kinds of crazy art stuff. Um, there are bazillions of these things around the world now. I think they claim something like 166 that are actually affiliated with Maker Fair, which basically means these groups sign contracts with Maker Media in order to get rights to use their little logo. Um, but there are, according to my research, a roughly equal number now of independent um, things like Maker Festival here in Toronto. Um, there's quite a lot of them in Canada, but many around the world as well. And in fact, there's at least five that go by the name Maker Festival, <laughs> which is kind of awesome, including one in India. And. Uh, I actually went to the first ever one where they had this absolutely enormous giraffe as well as um, something like 150 makers or so. And um, judging by my photos, it wasn't a major event in my life. It's one of those things I didn't bother to make a, its own gallery. It was like seven photos. <laughs> and I don't actually remember it other than this giraffe. But I think it was it planted a seed in my mind that became important to me later. And so, where's the next one? Oh yes, 2009. Um, by 2009, I had moved to San Francisco from San Jose, California, and was um, already a member of Noisebridge, which is the hackerspace there. And I was busy making things, mostly electronics related to wearables and stuff like that. Um, this is the famous Evie Bird Diet Coke and Mentos show, which is absolutely as ludicrous as it sounds. Two guys get up on stage and they take like 400 bottles of Diet Coke and they drop Mentos into them all and they create these spray shows. <laughs> and the, why, why do they use Diet Coke? Because if they use real Coke, the sugar makes everything sticky. <laughs> so um, when I moved back to Toronto in 2010, I was super pleased to find out that there was going to be a maker fair here. And there was in 2011, there was a an event run by the Treehouse Group and Site3, which is um, another makerspace here. And they had about 70 exhibitors showing off a wide variety of things. In the background there, you can see the Hack Lab table with our logo. Um, in the foreground is my friend Alan Major with his good robot display. He acted like a, a wheelchair in order to add a robot arm to it. And he had a bunch of other totally unusual creations. And in fact, Alan still comes almost every year to exhibit at what is now Maker Festival with whatever zany thing he's come up with. This year, he had uh, autonomous objects. So he's created a piece of online software that keeps track of where the autonomous objects are. The objects own themselves. You're, mere, you're merely their guardian. <laughs> in fact, I have one, don't I? Yeah, I think I do. It's still in here. <clears throat> well, basically, the objects just have like a little sticker on them. And the sticker just says the number of the object. And you can like, you know, somebody can request this object from me, in which case I'll receive an email with instructions on where to send it to. And then there'll be a new guardian of this pair of like pliers. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a zany idea. And, and Alan's bigger idea about it actually is that um, not only will the objects own themselves, but they'll each have bank accounts. So every one of these objects actually has a cryptocurrency address. Theoretically, it's got its own basically bank account and it will be able to make decisions about how to spend its money should it receive any. 
Um, most objects have a default policy of buying another of themselves on eBay if they acquire enough resources. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes sense to me. <laughs> Everything's got to reproduce, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there's this skipped over two years. Um, in 2012, the Treehouse Group decided not to run uh, a, mag a mini maker fair because apparently in 2011 they lost a bunch of money and they were trying to like gather their resources again. They were a very small group. Uh, Treehouse Group used to put on um, talks. Um, and actually some of them, I went to some of them, they were extremely popular talks or on, on a wide variety of subjects. The one I remember most actually was Ryan North gave a talk about his dinosaur comics. Anybody read dinosaur comics? That talk was spectacular. He basically talked for like 20 minutes about how exactly you make a comic where the art is literally the same every single time and still have it be funny after the like 400th strip. <laughs> and then he basically, he gave us all a copy with no writing on it and was like, you can make your own dinosaur comic. <laughs> Anyway, Treehouse Group didn't get up the, um, <clears throat> the energy to do it in 2012. And then in 2013, they actually passed it off to a group called FITC. Anybody know FITC? Used to be Flash in the Can, is now Future Innovation Technology Creativity or something like that. They put on gigantic tech conferences here in the city that cost like 800 bucks. I never get to go unless they want me as a speaker and then they give me a comp ticket. Um, <clears throat> but then FITC reevaluated um, what they were going to do for 2013 and decided they were stretched too thin to actually do it. Plus, they didn't see a way to make money, which I agree. There doesn't seem to be any way to make money with Maker Fair. Um, so um, they contacted me and was like, hey, we have this thing. Do you want to like do it? And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. <clears throat> and I called um, a bunch of my friends because I knew that I couldn't do it alone. The biggest thing I'd ever organized before that had been like a few meetups with like 50 people. And I'm like, hmm, 50 people, 5,000 people. Yeah, so I called a bunch of my friends, and my friend Jen Dodd agreed to help me out. She'd been with um, Subtle Technologies. Anyone know Subtle Technologies? It's a group that does um, a kind of an intersection between science and art. So they, they bring in scientists who have an artistic interpretation of their art, and artists who have science as their inspiration, and then they put on an annual conference which is, in my usual experience, filled with really bizarre things, like like ballet dancers acting out molecular bonds. And like, <laughs> they're just like, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> she did that. Um, um, and so they had like many conferences, usually up into the you know low hundreds, four, three, four hundred, and agreed to help me with this. And so we put one on. This is at Witchwood Barnes in 2013. Witchwood Barnes is a great venue for this kind of thing. It has a very old school engineering feel. They used to repair streetcars there. And we had about 45 makers. And um, fortunately or unfortunately, either way you think about it, um, 4,000 people showed up and it became absolutely as crammed as you see here. It was impossible even to move around for most of Saturday and large parts of Sunday. That was our number one complaint, it was, it was way too crowded. Uh, our number two complaint was that almost everything was 3D printed. Of our 44 exhibitors, something like 35 of them were about 3D printing, because that was super hypey in 2013. Um, but in general, it was a, a vast success, and Jen and I only had um, one day of sheer panic about how much money we were going to lose. Basically, on the Friday before the event, we'd only sold about 1,000 tickets. We needed to sell about 2,500 in order to break even. So we were, at, like on Friday at noon, we were like, we're down $15,000. And Jen and I were like looking in each other's eyes, being like, we split the difference, right? <laughs> yeah, terrifying, <laughs> terrifying. Um, but as, as it turned out, hordes and hordes of people showed up at the door and bought tickets even though it was raining. And so we ended up up about 5,000, which was pretty freaking amazing. Um, and then from there, um, we, do I have another 2013? I might actually. Oh yeah, we did all kinds of awesome things that first year. This is one of the amazing things which I have tried to replicate since and have never succeeded. We did what we called the robot cavalcade. We got every robot that was at the Maker Fair, the Mini Maker Fair, to bring them all to the same place. And then we literally had like a robot parade that went through the Witchwood Barns. And it was awesome. And then we ended in the middle with this epic photo shoot where you can see we have like five photographers, including me, I'm standing on the second floor. It was lots of fun. <coughs> Is there another one? Oh yeah, and the other thing that happened that year, which has inspired ongoing efforts, 
is the learn how to solder um, area. So that year we taught about 400 people how to solder. Um, and we could have taught way, way more, except I totally miscalled how many people would want to do it. So I only bought 400 kits. Um, they were mostly, they were gone by like Saturday at 3 p.m. <laughs> of a two-day event. <laughs> and, and so we improvised stuff that sort of worked on Sunday. But I learned that like we were going to need a lot more. And so every other year since then, we've had a thousand, which has usually been about the right number. And it's been a lot of fun designing them. And I know we've taught about 4,000 people, maybe 5,000 people how to solder now, which is awesome. So yeah, let me say, yeah, I guess I'll do this Y thing. <clears throat> so after the 2013 year, um, we were, I would say at a crossroads. We realized that uh, we needed a much bigger venue. We couldn't do it at Witchwood Barnes anymore. But we also we went to a bunch of the other venues in Toronto, like the Metro Toronto Convention Center and the International Center way up by the airport. And they wanted uh, spectacularly large amounts of money, like minimum $60,000 kind of thing. and. Uh, Jen and I didn't have the stomach for that. <laughs> like the the fifteen thousand dollar thing had already made us panic, and the idea that you know we'd be on the hook for that kind of money just didn't seem workable. But also, I really wanted to do it, and she really wanted to do it. And so we had a huge session. We actually did a retreat. Um, we went to this um, place. Anyone know the Royal Astronomical Society, RAS? They have a really cool house up by the Blue Mountains that actually has a gigantic telescope. It's a 14-inch mirror telescope in the backyard in a like special shed. And so we did this retreat there, and we talked about why. And um, <clears throat> these were my reasons. Everyone on the team had different reasons. But I did it mostly because I love to support the makers. I just love the idea that you know when you make something great, there'll be a place where other people can see it too. And you get to share your enthusiasm, and then other people get to be inspired, and maybe go home and make something for themselves. And so that, that's the big thing for me. Um, and, and part of that is the building of community, um, and part of that is just the having of absolutely enormous amounts of fun, not just at the Maker Faire itself, but also you know, at home when you're making the thing. I've made so many awesome things, like my Lumidroid Barbot, and my circuit stitching, and crazy wizard costumes, and all kinds of stuff. And showing them off is fun, and making them is fun. And I just want more of that for everyone, everyone. And so that was kind of the like why for me. Um, other people had other reasons. So actually, there was one of Jen's big reasons is she really loves the fact that Maker Festival is an all-volunteer team. Everyone who's on the team that helps put together the event is there because they love what we're doing, and we have a good time doing it. And so it's, she's really built, you know, inside of our team, quite a feeling of family and, and awesome in that way. And I guess that brings me to how. Yeah, so how the Maker Festival happens is enormous numbers of people, like all the ones pictured here, putting in stupendously huge amounts of time. So I myself put in something on the order of a couple hundred hours every year in order to make the Maker Festival go. And I'm not the only one. Um, this year, Jen and Andrew were right up there with me at a couple hundred, and then there's quite a large number of people like Aiden and Paul and Jung Hua and so on who all put in, you know, 50 to 100 hours. And we do it because we love it and because it's super huge amounts of fun. And um, one, one thing that I try to do to make it fun for people is uh, when I, you know, have something that really needs to be done, like the outdoor area, I super empower people to run with it and do whatever the fuck they want to do with it, right? So the fair is way too large for me to even think about micromanaging people to do all the things that need to be done. And so I give people way, way more than enough rope to hang themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and it's often amazing what can happen. So like the whole outdoor area with all the food trucks and the like unbelievable amounts of bureaucracy that the city imposes on anyone who wants to close the street it it's a thing and it's really cool and I stay the fuck out of it and just watch in awe as it happens 
and lots of other areas are like that. So this year I also sectioned off a piece that we called the Jumpstart Alley, which uh, was basically for like local startups. And um, Jennifer, and different than the other Jen, just like ran with that and really she was much more high contact, high touch with those people than I am with most makers. Like most makers only ever receive a few emails from me. But Jennifer was literally having like 30 minute calls with every one of the makers in the Jumpstart Alley, which is awesome, just to make sure that like they knew what was going to happen and they were getting what they wanted to get. Um, in terms of tools, I will actually demo a few of these. I decided since this is the GTA log, there has to be at least some technology, right? <laughs> so um, my friend Paul wrote this thing, which we call the Call for Makers back end. So in, the, in 2013, we actually used a Google form so basically people submitted a Google form and then there was like a Google spreadsheet on the back end and it was an unbelievable nightmare. Google forms, the Google spreadsheet is just not built to handle people when they submit like 400 word descriptions and then they go and will sell in a spreadsheet. Total nightmare. Plus there's not just like, you know, one or two fields or four or five fields. There's like dozens and dozens of them. They're not all here. And then there was no good way to like keep things with status. So we had instead of having this like little field where you can sort by status confirmed or whatever, we just were like coloring the cells of the spreadsheet green and red. Anyway, this is like a custom database. It's actually built on Oracle, which means we're like industrial strength. <laughs> and it makes administering the back end of somewhere between 150 to 200 makers so, so much easier. Um, anybody have questions about spreadsheets, databases? Yeah. <clears throat> Made things so much better. Uh, hmm? We could make it available to other groups. Um, in fact, we offered it to um, Sudbury, which now has its own Sudbury Maker Fest. Um, but they didn't take us up on the offer. So right now, it's basically private to us. But I would love to share it. And in fact, that attitude is in general true of what we do. Like, I would love to be able to share all the things that we do. And um, every so often, we do get contacted by other groups who want to run an event similar to ours. And I'm always super happy to talk to them and give them any kind of advice and, you know, point them with the tools we use and all that kind of stuff. Just because there's no, there's no reason to, like, totally reinvent the wheel every time, right? So here's what it looks like when you click into an application. There's basically just, like, a lot of, this is the, like, thing where we can change the status. Categories. This is where we assign the table based on the maps. And then, you know, you can see photos. You can see um, ratings here. And then also any kind of communication we have with them, we keep full records of it as well so that, you know, at least we know what we've said to them. Uh, the other thing that is a key part of running the event in the how is all of the people. So I mentioned Jen several times. She's the executive director now. Um, which basically means I consider her the big boss. She considers me the big boss. Whatever, it's it's mutual. <laughs> and then um, this year we had Andrew Duff who ran um, Creative Director, which is kind of a vague title, but is more work than all other roles combined, I think. He runs all of communications and marketing. So everything about the website, everything about the social media, um, every um, print or display asset, all of, like t-shirt design, all that kind of stuff. Um, Aiden's Director of Operations. So under Aiden is things like the volunteer team. This year we had 350 volunteers, all of whom got t-shirts and, you know, did various things like um, making sure people had the safety wristbands and giving people directions and um, helping to run the kids' activities and hundreds and hundreds of other things. Um, uh, making sure uh, makers got lunches. Paul here, he's the guy who actually makes the, uh, the Oracle thing go the call for makers. And then there's lots and lots of people, as I said, so volunteer managers. Um, Sophie here, she was the one who brought all the food trucks this year, as well as the other food makers. Um, Zheng Hua did the outdoor area. Uh, and on and on and on. You can see how many people it is. Vicky this year actually did an awesome job. Experience design lead. She made sure that the experience of everybody who was a part of the festival was as positive as it could be. And this included things like um, accessibility, so making sure that, you know, if you're a person who has special needs, there was a place for you at the festival. 
which is awesome. Um, Tarek is the guy who does all of our actual um, graphic design, so the cool t-shirts that you saw this year, that's him, it's always him, he's incredible. And anyway, you can tell there's just an enormous number of names, and this is the names from all previous years. So that's a little about how. Yes, so 2014 we came to the Toronto Reference Library, um, but we didn't get there immediately. Um, Jen and I actually started right after the 2013 fair when we knew that we couldn't go back to Witchwood Barnes because it was way too small. We started to tour other venues in the city, including the Metro Toronto Convention Center, minimum $60,000 the International Center way by the airport, um, the Queen Elizabeth Hall on the grounds of the CNE, um, this really bizarre, I guess you would call it a gymnasium where they do beach volleyball, but like he said he'd take the sand out for us. <laughs> um, the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, um, and all kinds of other places, and, and like basically none of them work for us. Um, and so by about um, November, Jen and I were extremely depressed about what the hell we were going to do for 2014. We hadn't managed to find a venue that we could afford that we actually thought would work. Um, and then um, Abe, of the, he was a contractor with Toronto Public Library, approached us and was like, hey, we saw your event, um, we think it's really cool. Um, we think we could host it at Toronto Reference Library, would you be interested in that? And we were like, oh hell yes, tell us more. Um, and Jen was already familiar with the building, I'd actually never been inside it. Uh, it's a beautiful building at Young and Eglinton. Um, it has Young and, oh sorry, Young and Bloor. Yeah, it has um, really unusual architecture on the inside. There basically isn't a right angle in the whole building on the inside, um, which makes it difficult to tell people where to go, but also it, it maintains like a creative feel for the event, which is super awesome. So this is a shot of 2014. Um, one of the interesting things here compared to later shots, you see how the second floor balcony up there is empty? In future years we actually controlled that, and you see those empty desks back there too at the top, we filled those as well in future years. Um, and then in the atrium itself, in 2014, we actually had exhibitors down there, um, and it was a real choke point. You can see right there, it's super busy, because people come in basically through the gates and then they get into this, this exhibitor area, um, and then they don't get from there up to all the stuff on the second floor particularly quickly. So it was a real choke point, and in future years we fixed that by taking exhibitors out of there and just having like larger scale spectacle things. Um, so it was, 2014 was an amazing year. Um, we, we basically doubled our attendance from 4,000 to 8,000. Um, and some of that is because our deal with the library is they provide the venue for free. We don't pay them a dime. But in return, they have a mandate from the city of Toronto that all events in their spaces are free. And so there's no ticketing, no charge ticketing for Mini Maker Fair at Toronto Reference Library. Um, and that actually somehow magically worked in our budget, basically, like we struck out our biggest revenue line, and we struck out our biggest expense line, and it sort of cancelled. <laughs> and um, what it leaves us with is we have some sponsorship, and then we have a few, there's about a dozen expenses all on the order of like two to four thousand dollars, things like renting tables, um, getting insurance, um, paying for city fees and permits, um, providing lunches for makers, and all of that. And so the whole budget of the Maker Fair, Mini Maker Fair, and Toronto Maker Festival is something on the order of forty to fifty thousand dollars every year. Um, and with that, you know, we we run an event that does fifteen thousand people. So it's like, what's that? Like two or three dollars a person? Yeah. And that is what brought us actually to is it twenty fifteen in the next one? Oh, I, I will, I'll do this story. Then I'll go there. So um, one of the bizarrenesses of working with the library is that they are a major Toronto institution, and there's like their union, their union shop, and you would think 
that they would be super uptight about all kinds of things. Like, that, that should be the way it is. They're an enormous institution. But in fact, we've discovered that the library is um, extremely permissive about all kinds of amazing things. And um, this was an example for the very first year. We asked the library if they would let us do something in the water feature that you can observe just as you walk in the gates. And um, it was a crazy ask. I didn't think they would say yes, but then they said yes, and we got um, what was then Maker Kids to come in and do this thing where kids would build small boats and small sailboats and then use box fans in order to blow the boats across the river. Um, frankly, the library should never have approved that. <laughs> we, uh, one poor kid actually fell in, but somehow managed not to bring the fan in with him, thus avoiding electrocution. <laughs> um, but kids did have an absolute blast. I know that um, lots of them take their boat home every year, and you know it's a it's a big memory for them. It's a life-changing experience being allowed to, you know, use power tools to build the boat and then, you know, wend them into this lake at the library and sail them across. It's completely awesome. And this really provided a model for us in all future years of working with the library. My goal every year is to ask the library for something where I feel like they really should say no. <laughs> and then, you know, when sometimes, sometimes we get the yes, sometimes we get the no, but either way, I feel like that's sort of part of my, part of my role in interacting with the library is to like show them what's possible if you're willing to take risks. And um, it's been remarkably pleasurable to like watch the library learn and grow with us over the years. Uh, oh yeah, so here's the retreat. The uh, um, this is the dome, or sorry, this is the shed where the telescope is, and then this is some of the like stuff we did while we were there. We wrote down. I don't know if you can see it, but there's the big word "why" on this, the one in the middle there, and all kinds of other. There's a crazy, yeah, crazy ideas slide. So it's like we just had this crazy brainstorming thing, <coughs> and. So <clears throat> that's the retreat in 2015. And then for 2015, um, we split from Maker Fair, Maker Media in the States because um, their model and our model were just incompatible. They wanted to charge us a dollar a person for our attendees, but we don't even sell tickets, so we don't even really know for certain how many people come. and. Um, even if we knew for certain how many, we can't afford to give Maker Media ten to fifteen thousand dollars in a forty thousand dollar budget. It just didn't work. Um, plus, our experience is we didn't get anything from them. Like they licensed us the little mini Maker Fair logo, the boxy thing that we hated, and this mini Maker Fair name, which we hated because like we're not exactly mini with ten thousand people, but that was our name. <laughs> um, and so we just decided you know, for $15,000 that we can hire a designer and come up with our own logo and our own name. And so that's what we did in 2015. Um, we rebranded, and I made that gigantic M, um, which in the library always looks kind of small, but if you compare to the size of people, you can get a true picture of how tall it actually is. It's eight feet by 16 feet. Like, thing is absolutely gargantuan. Um, and it was fun to make. I had, I learned a lot about fabric at large scale and how easy it is to like get things to like slowly warp as you go along. <laughs> it's remarkable how square it is, <laughs> given how difficult it was. <laughs> so we rebranded, um, and you can see actually in 2015 there's people along the second floor there. We took over the second floor balcony. Is the library still functioning? So. Interestingly, yes, the library is still open for um, the public to come in. And um, actually, this is one of the things that complicates our ability to know how many people come. Because lots of people come to the library on a, on a normal weekend, you know, like no Maker Festival, something like 4,000 people come to the Toronto Reference Library. And they sit down at the study tables, they sit down at the computers, they you know can't check out any books, but they can certainly look at the books. And 
Um, all of that still operates. I don't think I have any shots, but if you, if you were able to pan this shot just to the left, you would actually see there's a big bank of computers right there, something like um, 70 or 80 computers, and they're all busy with the library's regular patrons, like, you know, doing their usual, like checking their emails, watching YouTube videos, whatever it is they normally do. And that's also true on all of the other floors. All the computers are still in use. All the study tables are all still in use. And all of the usual library services, like all of the information desks and everything, are all still open. Um, and, and that is part of our like peaceful coexistence thing with the library. It's amazing if you step just like a half a dozen paces away from the balconies, the sound of the festival actually dies away completely. And it's just like a regular library. And it's such, I, I mean, I think it must be part of the genius of the architect's design of the building that that is still possible. Um, but we also do um, quite a lot to try to stay in the good graces of at least the librarians who work in the library. So every year we give out about 150 free t-shirts to all the librarians who work in the building. It, it's kind of amazing how many of them, like 150 people work in that building. You'd never really know it to look, but it's big. Uh, so 2016, um, by now we've like gotten used to the library, um, but we had this weird challenge. This year, the, the ROM had this, um, it's actually not a triceratops. It's like, it's called a Wendy ceratops. It's named after the scientist who um, discovered it. I'm not exactly sure how it's different from the triceratops. But anyway, they commissioned a local artist, Drew Lamb, to um, build this awesome four-person, no, maybe it's just two-person, two-person puppet. But then it turns out that this puppet is wider than a single door. It's wider, it's bigger than 36 inches, right? And wouldn't you know it, the library actually doesn't have any public doors that are double doors. Yeah, so Drew was like outside the library on Saturday morning being like, hey, I'd like to come in. And we're like, we'd like you to come in. <laughs> and it took us three hours to get that thing inside. Um, ultimately, what they did, it turns out there is, there is a double door on the first floor um, on the north side, but it's, um, it has pillars. It's one of those doors, you know, with the bars and they lock into a pillar in the middle. So we got security to come, prop the fire doors open, and unscrew the two pillars. <laughs> so, yeah, so that the dinosaur could walk in, <laughs> then screw them back in, and then we did the reverse on the way out. It was a nut bar. But I, it was another demonstration to me of like how far the library is willing to go to like support our cause, right? <laughs> um, and um, in awesome news, they um, in 2017 they actually spent um, something like 10 million dollars on a bunch of renos for the library. And one of the things that they did is they installed proper double doors on the first floor. So. And yeah, exactly. And so this year when we had a similar problem with there was this like Ryerson thing. Maybe it was, no, was it? No, I think it was a Humber thing. There was this like weird robot arm on a giant white box. And the giant white box was 37 inches, one inch too large to fit through the doors anywhere. But this year, security was like, oh, no problem. Just go over there. And we're like, yes. <laughs> People listen. Yeah. Books are small. Hmm? Books are small. Yeah. I, so this was the thing. Like that. This 2016, when this happened, my like my mind was blown. I'm like, how can you have a building the size of a city block whose largest door is 36 inches? Like. <laughs> this is all shipping companies assume for one door, so everything's built to a certain size. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Their loading dock isn't that big. No, no, their loading dock is relatively small. And then the loading dock, it, it's actually one of the more restrictive doors because they have these weird pillars in the hallway out of the loading dock. Yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> they have they've fixed it now, which is awesome. Um, and this was the first year, um, because we closed the street in 2016 for the first year ever, we actually ended up at the end of the year with an enormous amount of stuff. This was the first year where the amount of stuff wasn't just like a few boxes that I could keep in the corner. This was the first year where like we had these giant metal posts that we'd commissioned in order to be able to create a hanging net in the Globatorium. And we had these huge, the yellow boxes there, these huge tents that we bought. Because it turns out that 
you can rent a tent for about $150, but you can buy one used on Craigslist for about 100 <laughs> And so we're like, hmm, buy for 100 rent for 150 <laughs> Yeah, so we ended up owning three tents, um, plus lots of boxes of other things. So anyway, this is the loft in my garage at home. Basically, I stored a bunch of stuff that first year. Um, and since then, the amount of stuff we're storing has just grown stratospherically. Uh, here, so 2017. Um, this was the year um, where we basically maximized um, our footprint at the library. So you can see in the shot, not only we have the ground and the second floor, but we also have the third floor. And then also on the second floor, you see you can look back in that corner. Now we have makers on those tables as well, all the way around the corner. And so we basically control every open area on the first, second, and third floors in the library that is at all usable. Um, and that was good news and bad news. Um, but the good news is we controlled all the areas. The bad news is there wasn't any place else to go, and that's still the world we're in now. There's no place else to go in the library. Um, but this was a super fun year. We built this totally bizarre um, hanging octopus thingy, <laughs> which was lots of fun. Um, and then this, there's this one of our epic failures this year. Do you see that sphere on the ground? Yeah, so we had a theme that year, our, our t-shirts all said making worlds and then had this like picture of a really cool world with like interesting to tools and toys on them. And our idea was that the atrium would be filled with about a dozen of those big spheres and so there would be like worlds and we were going to have like an interactive activity where people would be able to decorate the worlds. But then, hopefully it's the next slide, yeah, this happened. <laughs> As it turns out, it's kind of difficult to make the worlds and so almost all of the worlds that we made ended up being these weird, deflated... <laughs> it, was the, it was just like so much epic failure. <laughs> so much epic failure. So anyway, after like building like must have been 20 of them and having basically all of them go bad in some way or other, we ended up with only the one. And so we had the one world. <laughs> Paper mache on the inside. Yeah, yeah, basically. And there was um, quite a number of failure modes, but the one that did the most damage to us, I think, was that the, you had the balloon on the inside and then you would paper mache it. And then um, at some point, usually the balloon would um, pop. And depending how hard the paper mache was, that, uh, that alone would cause it to collapse. Um, other, yeah, there were other failure modes too. Um, another of the failure modes was um, we had a bunch of like perfect hard spheres, and then we decided we should paint them. But the paint also caused the spheres to soften in such a way that some of them crumpled. <laughs> and then the, the final failure mode, and I don't know how we didn't see this coming, but the door to the room we were making them was only 33 inches wide. <laughs> There's an expression called the door to success. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, I don't actually even know how they got that. That one you see there is the one that we got somehow out of the room and into the center of the thing. Somehow they actually managed to have that thing survive a 33 inch door, which boggles my mind. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, um, Jen, Jen always says the great thing about um, trying really ambitious things and then failing is you at least you know you were trying something that legitimately tested your strength, right? Like if, the thing is, if, if everything that you try succeeds, then you're just left wondering, like, could we have done more? But when you try a bunch of things and they actually fail, then you know that you're like <laughs> trying real, <laughs> trying stuff. So, um, we've never tried to duplicate our um, paper mache experiments. That, yeah, we just learned lessons. <clears throat> it was fun, though. Um, also, 2017, um, we built this giant M, uh, which was lots of fun. But I put this slide in because, actually, you see the fire truck in the back. 2017 was the year when, um, we, don't, we don't actually know who it was, but a library patron called um, 911 and complained that um, the um, Toronto Reference Library was too crowded. 
and 911 send a bunch of fire trucks on an inspection of things, including fire exits and so on. And this was, in some sense, finally a vindication for me because I've spent every fucking year of the festival ultra paranoid about fire exits. In um, 2013 at the Witchwood Barn, they have all kinds of totally elaborate and obscure rules about what areas must remain free for fire exits and what areas must not. And the same thing is true um, at uh, the Toronto Reference Library. There are numerous fire exits all over the place, and makers just love to take up the spaces in front of the fire exits, thinking that it's an available zone. And so I spend hours every day, usually in the mornings, Saturday and Sunday, walking around and telling makers that they got to get their fucking shit <laughs> out of the fire exit. And anyway, in 2017, <laughs> fire marshals actually came and inspected the whole building and gave me a thumbs up. And I'm like, yes! <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was great. All of that work is not in vain. Fire exits do actually remain open. And nobody's died in a fire. And nobody's died in a fire. Um, and actually, I guess I could tell there was a... Hmm? <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I can now tell you the fire story, actually. In 2016, we had an arson attempt in the library during Maker Festival. Yeah, somebody actually tried to start a fire in the stacks and um, succeeded briefly, but one of our makers actually smelled smoke and ran and clapped the fire out with his hands <laughs> and then called us, yeah. And then we had a totally bizarre, uh, I guess you would call it like, like team huddle, where we decided that we would send a whole bunch of people out over the rest of the stacks to make sure that like no funny business is being done anywhere else in the library for the next hour or two. Yeah, fortunately, as far as we can tell, it was just like a you know teenage prank. It was not, in my opinion, likely to succeed in actually burning the library down. Like it was just a bunch of pieces of paper bundled into a pile and then set on fire inside one of the like stacks. But it's still kind of terrifying. Anyway, the library actually told us that this happens actually three or four times a year, <laughs> which you know both boggles my mind and I guess seems somewhat reasonable. Like the thing is, the library is always filled with all kinds of people, right? And you just have to imagine a bunch of like teenagers daring themselves or whatever. It's all too imaginable. But it also explains why the attempt was so crappy, <clears throat> right? So that's my fire story. The library did not actually burn down. Um, honestly, it doesn't seem likely to burn down, which is good. But um, every year we also have a, a, a major plan, evacuation plans, which we hope to God we never have to implement. Because, of course, it's a nightmare. It's a total nightmare. Uh, yes, 2018. Um, so for 2018, we actually did another, our second retreat to my mom's place in the middle of the winter. Uh, we built awesome snowman. And do I have another shot? Yeah, and we made some awesome food. And we talked about um, all kinds of things, um, primarily about what we can do to keep the event interesting for ourselves. Because... The thing about being in the same venue and running the same event every year is after a while it gets a little repetitious. And we don't what I don't want to become is like TCAF. As awesome as TCAF, you ever heard Toronto Comic Arts Festival? Yeah. As awesome as TCAF is every year, it really is the same thing every year. It's a bunch of vendors with tables with comic books on them, right? And I don't I I for one have no desire to run an event that does the same thing every year. And um, most of the team is, especially Dan is on board with me, like if we're not challenging ourselves, if we're not doing something different, we're gonna lose interest in ourselves. And if, if the organizing team loses interest, I think that it will show in the rest of the event. And so we came up with a bunch of more crazy ideas, um, three of which we implemented this year. One was the Jumpstart Alley. Another was the Maker Sandbox, which at, that, at this meeting we called the Anarchy Zone. <laughs> and, um, and then um, the third one was uh, makers on film. And um, and those experiments were lots of fun, especially the Anarchy Zone. I d I've never really done anything quite like it, but the idea basically we set aside uh, half a dozen tables in a small area and um, deliberately didn't plan it. We just told people, hey, you can show up and take whatever space you want and do whatever you like. And um, <clears throat> we had no real idea whether anybody would come or whether 
too many people would come, or whether they'd come with flamethrowers. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't, I honestly, when, in, in my imagination, what would happen was there would be a bunch of people who um, had last minuted their project and were going to show up for like a few hours. Um, but that isn't what happened. What actually happened in the Maker Sandbox, in fact, do I have, do I have a slide of it? No, I don't. <clears throat> but um, what actually happened is uh, a variety of groups who had learned about the festival too late showed up and exhibited for either all of one day or all of both days. And so there was no like dropping in for just an hour or two. Instead, groups were still relatively committed to being there the whole day and were relatively serious about it in the same way that you know most of our exhibitors make a two-day commitment. And so that was interesting. And I don't, I want to do it again, because it was, it was cool and it did provide a valuable place for people who, you know, have great projects but, you know, just didn't hear about it until mid-June or whatever. Great place for them to show up. But I also want to get back closer to the spirit of the anarchy zone, right? Like I do want to have a space where anything can go. And I just have to, I have to somehow figure out how to get people to like be more anarchic. <laughs> Um, so, 2018, oh, another one of the things that came out of that brainstorming meeting was um, Gorgeous Falling Things, which we had, um, CETA actually came up with two years earlier, an idea was always to do it totally independently of Maker Festival because it just didn't seem like the kind of thing that the library would ever say yes to. Um, the idea basically is people make some kind of very light thing that's designed to fall gorgeously, so you can think of it, it's made of like tin foil or tissue paper or or whatever, you know, pieces of beautiful fabric, and then throw them off a high surface and watch them like spiral and, and beautiful, gorgeously fall to the ground. And so this year we're like, well, you know, fuck it. We just pitched the library on this idea. We're like, hey, how about small children make things and throw them off your third floor balcony? <laughs> <laughs> And, and as, the, as the level of the libraries trusted us, they actually said yes. <laughs> Which still boggles my mind. I still, yeah, I'm like, really? But anyway, it actually was a stunning success. Um, you can see here, there's like hordes of kids up at the top, and their stuff is about halfway down. Um, and um, again, this year, just like my experience with the boat making, there were kids where clearly this had been like the highlight of their whole fucking year. They made something and got to throw it off the balcony with adults actually approving of this. <laughs> <laughs> and then watch it fall gorgeously. And then they ran down the stairs and climbed it at the bottom. <clears throat> and, uh, and it was also really amazing. Um, if you spent much time in the atrium at all, every 30 minutes, the, the like call would go out again and be like, ah, gorgeous falling things, and then people would throw stuff off the balconies and it would all tumble down. It was kind of awesome like punctuation for the event every half hour. So I, I don't know whether we'll bring it back, but it was totally amazing at least to have done it once, and um, now there's a whole generation of kids who think it's okay to throw things off the third floor balcony at the library, <laughs> which is awesome. <laughs> Um, and the, another experiment I mentioned, this is the Jumpstart Alley. So we had about um, 20, 24, 25 exhibitors that were startups in some way, shape, or form. Um, so it's like people who are taking their making to the next level in some professional way, um, either trying to sell the things they're making or trying to sell services around the things that they're making. And um, I think it actually worked remarkably well this year. Um, it's a little difficult for us to know. I mean, we've surveyed these people and they said they got a lot out of it. Um, but I would like to figure out how to take this in new directions too. Like, and lots of people actually have suggested we should do some kind of like Dragon's Den pitch thing and have a prize, which I think could be fun. Um, so that is something that we'll be thinking about for next year. Like, how can we take the Jumpstart Alley idea and make it into something even more interesting? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so impacts of the festival, um, it, it's difficult actually to measure a lot of the impacts, but some of the things we know for sure are approximately 4,000 people, um, mostly children, have learned how to solder. So they put together little kits, 
whether they're rocket ships or raccoons or whatever, um, and learned how to solder. Uh, 66,000 people have come through the gates. Um, obviously, that probably counts many people many, many times. I know it counts me hundreds of times. <laughs> um, six, approximately 600 makers have exhibited projects in total. Um, I know that many projects have been built ex like explicitly for Maker Festival, which is kind of amazing to think of. So it, like, it really is providing not just a venue to show it off, but like inspiration to actually do that project you've had in mind for years, which um, is really touching my heart. Um, and then um, I mentioned this several times already, but I feel like Toronto Public Library itself has been um, inspired by our festival to get more into technology. Um, and they've been doing a lot of really interesting initiatives like rolling out um, innovation hubs and now even design studios. Um, they have um, pop-up electronics labs and have been doing a lot of thinking about the role of public libraries for people in the 21st century. And so I think that like the library hosting us has been very important plank in their whole like innovation culture and demonstrates not, not just to, you know, Maker Festival and the makers and, and the attendees, but to the library itself, to the staff of the library, to the um, people who think about what libraries can mean. And so I think that is one of the, the biggest impacts for me anyway. And um, I serve on the um, Innovation Council of the Toronto Public Library, so I get to hear a little bit of their own internal machinations. And they do have this like giant bureaucracy, <coughs> which usually Thankfully, I'm relatively protected from, but it's fascinating to watch a really large organization try to come to grips with, you know, what, is, what does all this new technology mean for an organization which used to just lend out books? Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that um, has been a big impact on my life and in the life of many of the people who um, serve with me um, is just how much awesomeness it is to organize this event. Like, it, we just have so many really great meetings where we shoot the shit about what's possible, we come up with crazy ideas, then we pitch the library on them, and <laughs> God knows why, but the library says yes, and then we realize we have to do them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, I also know um, most of the volunteers um, this year we had 350 of them. Um, approximately 60% of them actually are high school students. And we've been told repeatedly, not just by um, the students themselves, but by their parents, that this um, volunteering at Maker Festival is life-changing for a lot of them. Like they get to see um, and experience, you know, a, a re a, like a team that really cares about what it's doing, that is delivering something that the public is obviously ravenous for. And um, we just, you know, make it feel like a family for them, and um, it can be life-changing for, you know, I mean, you know how high schools are these days. They're freaking dreary and demotivating, and so e even a taste of this, the kind of world that Maker Festival is, I think really is life-changing for some of our volunteers, and I feel really good about that, too. So that's some of the impacts. Ah, uh, yes, and then... <coughs> um, we have to go somewhere for 2019. Um, we will still be at the Toronto Reference Library. Um, I'm actually looking at places around the Toronto Public Library that we might expand into. Um, I don't know whether I'll actually do it, but I feel like I'm, I need more space. Um, and then um, <clears throat> I want to do new things. So yeah, I'm going to expand Jumpstart Alley, um, but I want to have other ideas too. And so. We'll be doing another big retreat sometime this year with the team where we're going to, you know, throw some spaghetti against the wall and see what sticks. But I'm also open to any ideas anybody else has. In fact, it would be fun to crowdsource it. Maybe we'll put up a survey, ask people what should be done. Um, and this, this shot is um, a shot of Witchwood Barnes in 2013. At the end, there's always this really weird phase on like Sunday night at about 7 o'clock where all the festival is like shut down and all that's left is a bunch of you know, like garbage bags and folded up tables and you're just like, was that it? <laughs> was that <laughs> like Because you know, like three hours before that it's just like totally berserk and then somehow it all like calms down and becomes this and it like that, that change is just 
surreal for me every year, every year. So um, I, have, I have this random slide, um, which is about all the other things that I could have talked about instead of this. And so I'm happy to talk about any of these things too. <laughs> but um, in general, that's the end of my talk. So if you guys have questions, I would love to take them.